Welcome to GFA TV's Global Vision. I'm Ryan Ayers. With so many concerts and performances going virtual these days, and guitar societies, schools, and concert spaces dipping their toe into this arena for the first time, we thought we'd do a deep dive into what goes into producing these shows. In this episode, we'll look at virtual concerts from three different perspectives. I was joined first by Joe Williams from Austin Classical Guitar, and we talked about the organizational side. Guitarist performer Gael Salal joined me from Belgium to discuss the artistic side. And live from his command center, I had Eric Pearson from Austin Classical Guitar fill me in on the technical side. It was great to talk to all three of them, hear about their experiences, absorb their extensive knowledge, and get inspired by their adaptability and excitement in seeing where things can go next. Enjoy. <music> My name is Joe Williams. I'm the artistic director for Austin Classical Guitar. What has Austin Classical Guitar been doing for in this time of live stream concerts and online events? We have been doing a lot of things. So, you know, as you may know, ACG does a great deal in the education world. And so we've We've developed a lot in terms of uh, supporting materials for teachers. Um, on the concert side, what that has come to be for our future is now three different series where we, again, are doing streaming concerts on a national stage. Uh, it's really exciting to be able to bring people from around our country to give concerts and bring them to Austin in a way. So those are live experiences. Uh, and unique experiences, those do not live on after they occur. Um, and then we have a, a series really focused uh, locally, which is called Austin Now. And it's a collaborative, interdisciplinary, hybrid streaming concert that is part live, part curated film, that is really as much about the process of creating uh, art about our time as it is experiencing it within that context of streaming. And we have a third series, which is called Austin Originals. Uh, a few years ago, we made, I wrote a, a film score. It's Alfred Hitchcock's The Lodger. So we're partnering with a, a movie theater to present that on their On Demand ser uh, series. We uh, are partnering with a, a dance troupe to, uh, to create a new life of a piece called I, We, which we uh, created around um, stories of Syrian and Iraqi refugees that were settling in, in Austin in their first 90 days in 2017. We're going to create that project again in a new way. And then we are partnering with um, uh, Mexicarte Museum to do a month long mini film uh, micro commissions for uh, artists to create uh, pieces inspired and part of the uh, Dia de los Muertos celebration. So those are Austin originals. <laughs> wow. Wow. You guys are really just hitting it on in all aspects, in all aspects. <laughs> Can you kind of walk me through um, what platforms you're using for your streams and how you came to choose them? Currently, we're using YouTube uh, and streaming straight to, to YouTube, whether it's pre-recorded or live material. So that that is our primary platform. Uh, it was a very complicated journey to get to that place. Uh, we started with Zoom, hacked Zoom, made Zoom sound good, and then Zoom changed the 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 encoding that it had. And it's kind of every time we've done it, we've been able to refine and refine. Uh, we've looked at other platforms, but YouTube is just so universal that it is the easiest to engage with. And does not have the built-in distraction that Facebook has with uh, its, its streaming uh, platform. All right, so now for your events, um, are you choosing to do, are they free? Are they donation-based? Is there a ticket price? Um, does it depend on the event? How do you decide? Well, all of our events that we started in March from then have been free. And they, there is an opportunity for donation and that has been a, a, a really, really active choice. Um, one is with so many people unemployed, with so many people suffering, we didn't want to put any barriers between people engaging and participating. What we found is that um, those who could support this work did, and they did it financially. And those who could support this maybe with their attention did. So we found that, you know, we, we were able to uh, 
create value that often a ticket price uh, describes based on engagement. So a very specific uh, metric there is that we have like 97, 98, I think it's actually 98 or more percent people attending the full duration of these performances. So so that's a way to like measure in, uh, value there. So it, we, we have, our audience joins us and stays. In order to bring in the artists that you want to bring in in order to su support the communities you want to support where does the where does the funding come from well we make it simple we hire the artists cover their fee uh that is appropriate for this these concerts and then we you know we again offer that opportunity to support uh through donations based on an audience member's desire and ability um, and then we also support all of our work through uh, a healthy uh, uh, grants and, and development uh, work that is, that is really, you know, I think at the heart of all that is this, the, the guitar organizations or any performing arts organization, it, it, it's like, I think, a, a real uh, spotlight on how incredibly valuable it is for the organization to have a relationship, a really complex and, and, and ongoing relationship that doesn't really start and end with the show. It can't start and end with the show. Uh, uh, otherwise, then the relationship, uh, it was very valuable, the relationship is then just with the artist. Um, and that is really, I mean, that's, that's a, a deep, powerful stuff. But as, as an organization, it's, it's crucial to, to, to fill that role of partner. Like, this is what my community needs. This is, this is my community. I care about them. They need art. And our job is to kind of find those artists that, that might be either the, well, it might be the thing that they need at that time if we're, if we're really doing our job right. <laughs> What's the system that you use for your donations then? Are you using still um, kind of, I assume that ACG had a donation system kind of built into the website. Have you had to pivot at all? Have you had to introduce anything new to help um, make it more direct in this video landscape? There, there's like a psychological thing that I think that happens whenever you buy a ticket, like you fill out this stuff and you know that you're making a date and you, you kind of attribute value with the, maybe the money or the cost of that, of that ticket. Um, so, so there is in, in place of that, we basically created an RSVP form. Like I'm, I'm saying I'm going to go right. And in that form, there is like a, 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 a donation portal. So it's like it, very, very uh, light invitation saying, you know, if you would like to donate, this is this is the place you would do it. And we kind of had that infrastructure um, in place, of course, because of, of donation opportunities uh, outside of the pandemic. But we also there was something that was a real, um, really easy transition is for a couple of years now, we've been doing a, a program called Tickets for Good. And what that means is we look to nonprofit organizations in our community and basically they could sell tickets to our show. So I'm putting it in parentheses or in quotation marks and get like 100 percent of the ticket price. And so what that means is like Refugee Services of Texas or Red Oak Hope uh, that, that helps uh, um, social service uh, organizations in our, in our community could basically turn to their audience and say, hey, we're doing a fundraiser through ACG. You can, you can get this uh, and, and we can help support them and, and get to know their audience and their, their community a little bit. So basically we've been using that kind of, we already had the form, like directly, we just had to change some of the materials to, to make it for ACG. And, uh, and we actually have, could still continue to do tickets for good through this process. How big is the team that you need to assemble to put on one of these concerts? To, to make this sort of event happen, you do need really capable and, and, and smart people who are paying close attention. <laughs> and they all fill very different roles. Um, we, there is somebody who is 
running the streaming process, and that is Eric Pearson for us. Uh, there is someone who is uh, dealing with sound, and sometimes that is also Eric Pearson. If we are very lucky, we have a person on site who is uh, who is in the room dealing with sound. That is crucial. So that's our stream, also connected with video audio. We have a somebody working with uh, the, the chat and the audience engagement. Uh, sometimes we have up to three people there working on, on that. Um, we have an MC. Uh, and as I, as I mentioned before, usually that's myself or Matthew Hensley. Um, we have, <laughs> I think that's everybody. Well, we have like, we have like basically those four roles and then we have people who are backing those people up because somebody's internet could fail. And if uh, if that happens, who who can be uh, who can jump in there to, to fill that role? So it's somewhere between uh, five and about nine people working on this uh, in in these different capacities. How does ACG interact with the audience? We've done this in a variety of ways. Uh, you know, there's a real awesome opportunity with this platform or this this medium to have things that have been created before so like interviews uh with the artists like in advance we have done like uh <clears throat> excuse me uh live uh q and a's after the show where we have an mc who basically takes the questions and, and shares them with the artist um we have different ways to interact over the chat in in the youtube or in zoom if that's what we're doing um Looking always for more opportunities. This is, I think, a real area for development in which we can we can uh, empower our audience to, in, to to engage in a way that, that we just don't have the opportunity to on a regular stage. Are there any bonus incentives or additional events that accompany the concert? You know what I love about these shows is that everybody's in the front row. And I think whenever we're creating any bonus or any audience engagement, it's it's absolutely inclusive. So it, what we do is is like I said through the chat and through the interviews and and sharing information about the the show in advance and then following up afterwards. Those are all kind of universal. Um, we are with the different series that we're developing this uh, this fall. I think there's there's this whole array of other levels of engagement. You know, uh, one of the series that I mentioned to you is Austin Now, which is uh, interdisciplinary uh, local uh, artists um, creating creating uh, concerts that are about here and now. You know, so so they're in like some of them are eight weeks, some of them are twelve weeks long, where it's a painter and a and a musician uh, engaging and creating this like totally a uh, new form of, of uh, concert experience in that built into that is this sort of like generative uh, uh, procedural art project that our audience, I think is going to be able to engage with. So for example, uh, over the, over the weeks leading up to Joseph Palmer, guitarist and Ryan Runcie painters uh, performance called cycle you'll see sneak peeks of some of the paintings that Ryan are making. You'll see like these tiny videos and there will be invitations to think about some of the things that they're thinking about and invitations to comment and share with us what our audience is thinking about as it relates to these art projects. Oh, that is absolutely fascinating. <laughs> so in terms of getting that word out, are those are those sneak peeks and the build up to the concert um, is that coming through your email list? Is that coming through your YouTube channel? Is that coming across all social media? What What's your strategy for for um, of creating creating that excitement for the event? So we have we have a really healthy newsletter that we engage with, uh, and so that's like a that's like the straight like connection uh, with social media. We are, we have a kind of a calendar of, of things and a lot of stories to tell. So we kind of have to plan that out. Um, and uh, so, and, and they all have like their own kind of characteristics. So Instagram and Facebook are different. Those are the two primary social media uh, uh, 
um, mediums that we work with. But yeah, just basically sharing those uh, over the course of, of the time that we know that we're going to meet up and, and be able to spend time with people and, and try and arm them with as much uh, excitement and information and inspiration as possible. What sort of length are you going for with the events? We really have to evaluate this in this as a medium unto itself. So references to a, a live concert are are just references. They're they're not they can't be the model. I think that that that's a mistake. So we hit pretty early on that a 45 minute presentation of music that has room to open up a little bit like to have an hour experience uh really fit what the the medium wanted. You know, and, and that that I've, I I cuz you can do it longer. But it's hard. It's hard on everybody, and and so the return of that I think is, is tough. Every every artist kind of has a duration based around what that program is, but it is almost always within that hour sh- framework. Um, I do think that there's opportunities to do like multiple shows uh, on the same day, different programs. I think that would be fun and something interesting to do. Uh, that we haven't done yet. We've done two, we've done double shows of like one hour a piece, uh, like at a seven o'clock and a nine o'clock show, same program. I think it would be interesting to do a, you know, a six, eight, 10 different programs. Maybe this is a way that we really get to experience those big works. Any, any final tips, tricks for anyone putting on an event? Yeah, I would, I would love to share some advice for, for artists in this role i think that one the greatest place to be as a, as an ambassador for culture and an expression of the human spirit which is what artists do the greatest place to be is to embrace this as an entirely new thing do not wait for clapping don't even hear it as an option in your mind there will be silence and that silence is magnificent and beautiful if, it, if you embrace it. I think it's a way to have one of the most um, intimate concerts. Most often we're in your home. And to be so generous to bring people into your home and to be so generous in sharing music with them and to be so open in those periods of silence, that is the the place for greatness here. Uh, I think that I, I'd love to share I, something that I think about a, a lot as, as a presenter, as somebody whose role is to, um, is to facilitate and make things happen. I think all, all of the organizations, uh, I think we really have to have, a, again, a continually uh, a rejuvenated picture of an audience member a specific person even to think how, if this is a gift, how would I want to give this gift to, to, to that audience member? If it's, if it's, if you, if you need to think of your mom, you need to think of like somebody that you really truly cherish and say, how can I make this valuable for them? And, and all these big and small ways, I think that kind of transforms this into a very satisfying endeavor. Oh, beautiful, beautiful (laughs) points. Joe, thank you so much for joining us today on GFA TV and for sharing all of your knowledge and experience and all of your passion for bringing these events to audiences um, around around Austin, around Texas, and around the world. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan. And, and thank you so much to the GFA for, for making this happen. It is an absolute joy. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Gael Solal. I'm from France, but living in Belgium, in Brussels. Uh, I'm a classical guitar player, uh, soloist, and also doing a lot of chamber music. And in the last years, uh, I've been training myself into theater, clowning, impro theater, dancing, a lot of things. And I've built a show called Crazy Nails uh, with Boris Gacker. And I'm creating all the time new things. So I have big projects for the future. And so how has it been for you moving into uh, this landscape of virtual and online concerts? 
to be completely honest, like 100%, I didn't play guitar at all for at least three weeks because I was so shocked. I was so shocked. Things, things canceled, the situation, pictures, the news. I was just like, oh my God. So like the artistic part of me was just like, Woo, very, very far away. But then I, I got this proposition by uh, Tom Bay. They wanted to do like a, a live, live concert. And I said, okay, let's book it. So I give me like, even one one more month to do it so I could figure out and practice. <laughs> so, because I kind of know myself by the time. When you get older, you really know yourself. I can't give the best of myself if I am not in a concert situation. Really, this is not me. So if I'm just here in my place, I play, I, I practice, but there is not this <laughs> extra kick. Uh, so I decided to do it uh, where I practice. I have a, a co-working space in a really nice place, it's called Palazzo. So I have my I have my little cabin where I practice. And I asked the owner if she could let me the whole space for the night. And we could use the light and all of this. And one of the, um, there are many artists there and what two of them, they are video artists. And they offered me to do it with, like, I don't know, like four cameras. And I was like, okay, so let's do it. So. Like a few weeks before we did all the tests, they had like cameras, the lights with the plants, everything. So we really built like all of it. And the same day I did it and I, I played for like three people, the three video artists. So there was a small an audience. audience. <laughs> it was good for me. Um, it helped me a lot. And also I, I really tried to organize like everything in the sense of uh, what would you do the day of a concert. So you would kind of rest, you would try to have good food. So I tried to organize some food to arrive like two hours before so we could all eat together. I had my concert clothes, concert shoes, makeup, <laughs> earrings. So really like everything and everything I do, like which people don't know, I don't want to know, like on my routines, you know, like uh, the nails, uh, the exact stuff I do before, whatever, uh, because I'm a very superstitious person. <laughs> so I did all of that. Like really like, I'm going to give a real concert, and um, and I did it. And really, when you look at it, it looks like a real concert broadcast, unless there is no applause. Were you taking a program that you had been playing and tinkering with it? Were you playing a new program? How did you adjust what you were playing? Uh, I was very like, uh, I said, I want to enjoy, I want people to enjoy, and I don't want to be like in danger. So I played a program I play which is my new program for a few months. Um, I wanted to enjoy. And also I really thought about the, the duration of the concert, like 45 minutes, 50 max. We shouldn't do more because afterwards, like people are not watching or, or if they're watching as a sleep, sleeping in front of the computer. <laughs> <laughs> so I did like, I think 50 minutes, like from beginning to the end. And um and I also thought a lot about the, like the format because I've seen a lot of live concerts, also like from not only from classical musicians but pop artists, whatever. And they were doing it with the computer and answering people. Like they were like, "Oh, hello, uh, I don't know, Barbara, Delphine, whatever. Hello, ma'am." <laughs> you know, like all the fans. Oh, and people were asking them to play stuff, and they were playing and computer playing and computer. And my point of view, I, I don't like this, but this is only my point of view. Uh, so it's very interactive, but I don't feel like I am in a concert or in a show. And what I prefer, I think on earth, is either be on, being on stage playing or either being in the audience watching a show because I just escape from my my real life, from my bills, from, from the situation, from the life. And I can just, just go and take a train with someone and go wherever. And um, I, I thought a lot about that. And people said, oh, yeah, it's nice if you interact. And I'm like, this is not me. I'm not going to do it well. What, whatever I design as a show, as a concert, as whatever I do as collaboration, I always try to, to do what I would like to see or hear. That's the way I build things. How are you setting the parameters for the, the audio and the visual? So wh what I did is... Uh, I checked before some other videos and also which kind of views, because I had the possibility to choose like four different sort of views, uh, which kind of views of the hands were nicer for me and in general, what I like to see. So I really checked a lot of videos to see, okay, if you have the camera like this, it's nice. If you see also the face in the left hand, it's nice. If you go like on the right side, 
from down, you have a really nice view, and you don't see like this, which is so boring, nasty. right? There's just, just flat hands. The, you actually see the fingers. Yeah, this yeah. is boring. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then you see really like the fingerings, and it's really beautiful. So, if you, so we did a lot of trial, and I was like, I'm more like this, more of that. So, in that part, that was my expertise, the aesthetic part, and then they would fix it. And then for the mic, we did a very good thing, I feel, because I knew, uh, also I, I did the concept as I would do it normally, which is I, I always present what I play. Very simple way. I just say, now I'm going to play this. A few words about what it is, but more words if I need to precise something, and then I go. And I didn't want to have to take a mic to talk and to do this. I didn't want to do that. So we had this little mic uh, on my shoulder here with um, wireless. And you couldn't, you could, you couldn't see it really. It was really like very discreet. And was that only for when you were speaking? Yeah, it was only for the voice. And then I had uh, a mic in front of me, and this also we we ran to really try to find with acoustic of the whole like a really nice sound because the 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 video artists they were there was like six cameras and some were moving around me, and they were mixing in real time, like the. And we they were doing the montage, yeah. Did you just do all the rehearsals that day or did you do a day of rehearsals beforehand to do all the blocking for the camera moves and the setups? So we did all the rehearsals like one week before because we wanted to make sure, they wanted to make sure the camera was a good one, which materials they would need if we needed to hire, um, to to ask people. For some, and we discovered we needed like a little, um, what do you say, like stand for the mic to have it really down. We also check like the light of the sun because it, there is like, um, now we did all of that. <laughs> it's crazy. We had like windows. Uh, it's like a very big windows on the, on the, um, on the ceiling. And th it was seven o'clock. So we had to think at seven o'clock at that time, it was already getting a little bit night. So we thought, okay, we need to already fix the light. Ah, and do all of this. Cause, the, Cause the light would actually change during yeah. the, during the concert. Would yeah. have, and the light, if you see it, it changed a little bit. So because it was seven o'clock, yeah. But I really liked this uh, taking one week before and doing all the tests because if you do it like one day before and already it's good to just say, so I had one week then to say, oh, wow, this is real. It's going to happen. Okay, so I'm going now to, and I could prepare myself. I think the the most difficult part of it, but, oh, okay, apart from playing guitar, which is absolutely difficult. Okay, so this, we take it out. We know. This is a difficult instrument. Um, the difficult part of a live concert is you have to kind of feed yourself alone. So there is no applause, there is no reaction, no silence, no listening quality. There is nothing. So I just set, I did a mindset like I, whenever I finish a piece, I will imagine people are clapping. <laughs> So I would finish and I would really let the sound and cut it and in my head like listening like yes! and then you know like this is always like a little decrescendo and then stop and then take a little breath and speak again because otherwise also I've been watching some uh, live uh, uh, concert uh, live stream uh, concert and everything is packed so people play they stop they play and it's like, ah, take your time. <laughs> because in a normal concert, you take your time. You already have, um, it's not a lot, but it can be like 20 seconds, which is a huge amount of time by yourself, like 20 seconds of in your head. <laughs> so that would be my first advice. I did it and really, it helped me a lot. Um, what I did also is uh, I really tried, Everything I played that day was by memory because for, for many reasons. So first, if you, you have to look the score and maybe you can, you have to do a lot of arrangement so you don't see the stand. And so it's not nice, like aesthetically. And also because you kind of lose some concentration because you are taking the, taking the score. So it's much better to be completely like fully into what you do and uh, and then I added something else, which is something I normally do for my concert is really to, uh, I train my concentration. So I was really completely focused on what I do. So really I did like before, like some, I do little meditation and taking ideas out and, you know, like this small talk, like, 
mm, there is like a dark fortune, maybe you can do it. But God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all of this. <laughs> so all these negative thoughts, I really just, oh, I write them down and then I just throw them or all these mindsets I do normally, but this, I, I did it really much more, much more because I felt like it was, I was more in danger. And in fact, when I finished, I was twice as tired as a normal concert. Take your food stool, uh, take um, your scores if you're going to need them. Uh, take the light with uh, the sun and all of this. Check all the batteries of every single device you're using. So you need to have a second battery uh, ready to be plugged in. Um, in the checklist, I will add also, if you're doing it by yourself, you need someone else. And it's not, um, it's not true we can do everything. We're already playing, doing the audience in our heads and whatever. So it's like, so you need someone to be there for whatever happens. Because when it's running, you, you need an assistant, if we can say it like this. Um, any friends, family can do that <laughs> for you. <laughs> it's one hour, come on. <laughs> The battery, uh, we had a technical problem during the show about like one ba one battery of, of the main ma mic went down. And so during one of the pieces, you can hear, which is the mic just going down. And I, I, I hear, when I was playing, I, I could hear a little noise, like, I could hear this. And I, I, I saw they were like moving and I, I, I could feel it was like agitated, but I didn't know what was going on. And they didn't prepare a second battery. So... It was a little bit tricky, but this mic uh, did the um, transition. So you had at least uh, the, um, this mic uh, was taking the sound of the guitar. For the time, the battery was <laughs> deblocked. <laughs> um, and also in that case, I, I really felt, uh, you know, I'm not very like, um, you say like a, a cold blood person, like you are. I'm not like this. So when something is going on, I'm like, I'm panicking. And you can see that in my eyes in the video. It's like, she's, she's freaking out. And I, I keep playing. I was saying this morning, and I was like, guy, keep going, keep going. They're going to fix it. So this is why you need also someone to take all your mental uh, panicking in, into the technical. So they find the solution. And, and of course, people then in the comments said, oh, that was beautiful. Unless the noise at minute. 435 in this moment it's like okay thank you guys it's like we have one so it's like i'm like we have one technical problem it's also something i think we should like advise like if you're going to see a live stream there is there are technical problems for everyone even the top organization everyone is going to have a problem so please just give us a break it's part of the ticket just give us a break. <laughs> Yeah, so that was the, yeah, the checklist, also the link of the Facebook, so it was not easy. So if you can do like a fake Facebook Live to check and then have it. Any final tips or tricks? For presenters to to really do it like in advance, not say, okay, let's do it next week or this. So, so people can have time to say, okay, what should I do? What gear to make this try out? Try the Facebook Live because most of the time the presenters want the Facebook on their Facebook line. So you have to coordinate both your Facebook and them and just to do some tests. So, and this can be really tricky sometimes. So like advance, doing things in advance to plan it. Uh, for presenters also to, maybe it's a strange, um, yeah, sentence, but to, to call people from everywhere. So you, you don't need to call only people as it's global. So you, you can call people from everywhere. <laughs> you can afford normally people from every corner of, uh, but unless like the time and distance, more or less you can find out a way and then do maybe a pre-recorded concert. So also open up your programming to everywhere. <laughs> For artists, um, really think of the program you're going to play um, uh, in terms of um, the capacity of what we have nowadays as um, concentration. Um, maybe do shorter concerts, maybe do two halves. I, I don't know. Think about the format and uh, a thematic concert or a line, this something people can grab on. And and for presenters also, and artists, if you want to do it by yourself, to really check this uh, tip jar and all of this beforehand, how it works, uh, and check all of that. And I would also suggest to have always someone uh, 
helping you with all the assistance. And also someone checking because I had this very weird experience on my tone based live. There was someone who posted a comment with a fake link, which is like, wow. A fake link leading to a credit card stealing page. Yeah. You need people to just check, like everything is good. No one is getting mad in the comments or whatever. Just checking everything is smooth. <laughs> Well, Gael, thank you so much for joining us today on GFA TV and for sharing your experience. And we wish you the best of luck uh, moving forward. Oh, thank you very much. I was very glad to share all of that with you. And I wish everyone luck. And yeah, we're going to make great things, I feel. <laughs> and thank you very much for the GFA TV. Bravo. <laughs> My name is Eric Pearson. I'm the director of curriculum at Austin Classical Guitar in Austin, Texas. And in addition to um, working with our online curriculum and our materials, I'm also heavily involved in our concert production and event production, and recently the move to remote teaching and remote events. And so I do a lot of our remote video, audio, streaming, uh, stuff like that. So if it's got a wire plugged into it, it's, it's probably my responsibility. <laughs> How do you set up for your capture for audio? I'm running things from my home um, kind of office setup here, kind of call it the command center. And so um, if we're doing something pre-recorded, which is kind of one, I guess, uh, paradigm that people are probably doing right now, I've, I've worked with a lot of other guitar societies, then you've got your, you know, your audio is pre-recorded. So that's really just on the person capturing it if they're going to use a Zoom recorder or a mic with an interface if they've got their own digital audio workstation set up or whatever. And then the way we m manage it here is I just play that video through OBS, open broadcasting software. And so all that's pretty much taken care of. The audio is internal to this program. You don't have to do anything. Um, the piece that makes it interesting is if you're going to add other real-time elements. And so the one big piece is the um, either the announcer or the MC, Master of Ceremonies. So we've been using Zoom. That's one way to kind of get a meeting audio um, in and then combine that with, um, you know, your program or your, or your pre-recorded stuff. And so using OBS or there's other streaming software, there's things like uh, Wirecast or vMix. And it's basically just a way of combining different elements. So you can have audio, you can have pre-recorded video, and then you can have live content. So things coming in from Skype or Zoom or whatever. And so that's mostly done in the software. Um, my audio setup's pretty unique um, because I've come from a, a place of doing a lot of live audio. Um, and so uh, before we even kind of had to deal with this, I was using a, a, a system called the MR18, which is a soundboard um, by Midas. And it's a faderless mixing system. So that's basically just a stage box where you plug in your audio and stuff. And so I actually output, like even right now, uh, your signal from my computer into this, and then I have total software control of it. Um, and so I'll bring up its control surface. So it's just a software control mixing board where you've got all the effects and EQ and stuff that you'd have with a full mixer, um, like if it was an M32 mixer. And so it's pretty complex, but it gives me a lot of routing options. So I can bring in, um, like if you say something right now, I would love to say something right now. There you go. So that I get to route that wherever I want. I can send it to any of six different augs outs. And so that gives me the control to add effects to things I want to or to, um, let me go back to my main view here. Um, and so that's you know more complex than a lot of people need, but because I'm bringing stuff from um, pre-recorded stuff that's in OBS, but also a Zoom meeting or Skype or um, other input like that, and sometimes I want to EQ it or change the levels or um, even add noise cancellation effects or reverb and stuff, especially if you're talking about music, and then someone's sending me just a clean, dry signal, then I'm able to add effects. So that's the, really the big reason for me to use this is when we get into the live streaming part, which I haven't really talked about because that's a bigger conversation um, yet. You do a lot of research and you're very good at finding um, what's going to be a great system for you to work with, whether it's hardware or software. So why OBS for running this? Yeah, so um, open broadcasting is open source software, so it's free. Um, it's being worked on by a community of people. So I just actually added a plug-in yesterday for a really cool uh, um, um, capabilities that I didn't have. And it was just free and something called GitHub where people put their own software projects. So, um, you know, it takes a little more thought and work. It's kind of, you know, 
a more technical thing to get set up, but it's really has a lot of options. It can do exactly what they want. And if it doesn't, someone else had the same problem and they've made a solution. And so you can just take their plugin, install it. And now you've got that function. I should show you, you know, what it looks like. I think I have, this is OBS. And so I'm, I'm using it currently to do the meeting with you here. And so I've got just dozens of scenes kind of pre-set up with everything I, I might want, videos, audio, all that. I've got um, the audio inputs here, and right now I'm recording. I could test streaming it as well. And so everything kind of just goes left to right. Um, and then this is that new piece I added here, the media playback control that wasn't in there before. So this is a third-party edition. So um, it's, you know, it, it takes a while to get to figure out what everything does, but once you get it figured out, like I'm gonna switch back to my my picture here with the transition. And so I'm back. Um, so yeah, that's it's price and also uh, flexibility for me. Um, the the other big one that we're actually ordering, it may come today if you hear a knock during the meeting, um, is TriCaster. is a really popular system. It's expensive. That's like pro level um, pr production. So like you know your ESPN and newscasters, they use the full suite of that. Well, they have a smaller version now that I actually just ordered this week. Uh, TriCaster Mini. Um, and it's a small computer box and a you know camera and stuff, and so that's for our next generation of stuff we're starting this this month, um, hopefully with the Pepe Romero concert, and that's going to be doing live streaming with a PTZ pan tilt zoom controlled camera, and so we'll remotely control what it's zoomed in on, looking at, um, hopefully multiple shots, and that system you don't need like the software it's built into the hardware, um, so it's kind of an all in one custom solution you don't have to have your own computer um, but it's pr very pricey i mean we're talking in the ten thousand plus range to get the most basic setup so what has been your current setup um for cameras of bringing um live footage so if it's e either the live host or if you've been piping in live performers the paradigm of pre-recorded the obs is fine you you've got everything you need you can add some live you know um master of ceremonies or interviews to it and control it live and then stream it to your YouTube or Facebook, whatever your platform is. Um, to get live streamed performance was a very big challenge because um, number one is internet. You have to have stable and fast internet on both ends and um, it becomes more challenging you know, the farther you get away. You're adding more hops and, and lag and stuff. And so we have to do a tech check feasibility with any artist before we even kind of book them to say, you know, are you do you have stable enough internet at your home? Can you hardwire plug in an ethernet to the, you know, the computer? Um, so we did a couple events with people's own setups, you know, their camera, their computer, and it was tough. I mean, there's, you know, some people are pretty savvy and it worked great. Some people are, don't have the equipment or the experience and you, it's, it's very difficult to kind of walk them through what we need to get it set up. Um, and so we built a streaming rig um, into a big, you know, Pelican case, which consisted of a really powerful uh, laptop um, a pretty good 4K webcam. Um, they're called the, the the Brio, is the type of Logitech camera, um, and then a, an AT2020 Audio Technica mic, which is pretty good for the price. It's excellent um, condenser microphone, and I think I have one. Yeah, I took it off my 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 stand here. So <laughs> there's that with with the uh, kind of uh, pop filter on it. Um, yep. And, and so we sent a basic kit out to a couple of artists in the last few months, and that worked really well because it just took a lot of the technical setup out of their hands, and we could just get them through it. Um, but we do have to have a, a definite a tech rehearsal for that because it's a lot of stuff to get set up. In order to get, since it's a condenser microphone and it needs phantom power, what's what's in the kit to get them the phantom power? So currently we're using, they have a USB version, which is a great part because it has its own internal um, electronics and stuff. So you just USB into your laptop. And so it sounds just as good. I did a comparison video because I had the same question as well, is this going to be as good? And it's a really, really good option. I've told that dozens of people that are teaching or trying to do, you know record is like, you know, up until the several hundred dollars more expensive, it's, it's really excellent. I think it's, you know, quite a bit above like the, uh, blue, you know, blue snowball or, or Yeti mics. In terms of the variety of cameras that you've been able to make work with some of the artists, so you have your kit, which just makes it really nice and simple and you can send that out. But with the artists, it's it's been a series of probably webcams, um, 
DSLRs? Has, has it been a wide variety that you've been able to make work once you have that tech kind of rehearsal and conversation? Yeah, some people had their own cameras, which were pretty good, you know, like the camcorder HDs plugged in with a HDMI cable, and those those can work pretty good. Um, I'm learning a lot. I'm not a, normally a video guy and, and lens person, but I'm having to learn a lot about ISO and aperture and all this. And so right now I've got a DSLR, um, a Sony, uh, with with a HDMI out, and I capture that um, with a Blackmagic capture card on my tower. So I'm not using a laptop. I'm using a, a computer tower I built. And so I've got a card. Um, there's also some units. I, th- I don't know if it's Elgato has one where it's a little box that'll have a USB 3 out to your computer so you can capture video from a camera like that. Because usually you've got like webcams that have a USB connection and they pretty much plug and play with most computers. And then the next level would be like a DSLR or something that has the option to stream live video. Um, you have to research because not all of them do. So you have to be very careful to be like, you know, does it have HDMI out? And is it definitely allow streaming, you know, real time while you're taking it? Um, and then the next level is actual video cameras. And so this new tech is that um, that we'll be getting soon. Um, I haven't done too much with the kind of pro level cameras, but this just gives you better lenses, but bigger sensors. Um, that's one thing I learned. It's very important kind of talk about t- uh, tips and tricks for people is pay attention to the light levels. So right now I've got a pretty good light setup. I've got like one light on my green screen here, um, just kind of demonstrating lighting. And then I've got two um, color temp controlled lights. And so I can actually do some pretty drastic uh, temperature change here. And so that's just with my uh, cell phone app here. Ideally, it'd be great if you had perfect sunlight coming in at the right angle and all that. But most of our concerts are at 7 or 8 p.m. So we have to, you know, tell people, hey, go get this lamp and turn it this way and all that. And so we're getting to the point where we're like, all right, well, here's a really small LED panel light, very thin. And you can pack that away pretty easily and send it. And so going forward, we're going to have LED panel lights that we can control through um, Wi-Fi. So that'll actually be in your kit. Yep. And then, like I said, the, the 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 actual lighting level. So you realize indoors is quite a bit different than outdoors. So you may have cameras that look great, um, which a lot of the ones I tested. And then you get to a hall or someone's home at 8 p.m. And you realize the, the dark areas have a lot of noise. Um, and so when you have like a deep black color in your picture, that can be noisy, especially with less expensive cameras. And so the sensor size and then what's called the ISO level is something to look at. And, you know, at some point you probably want to talk to someone who's pretty familiar with photography because they'll, they'll give you a lot of the information like, oh yeah, this camera has a, you know, full, full frame sensor and it's really good at low light conditions. Um, Because otherwise, like right now, I've got my ISO way down, so it's not very noisy, but I'm really overlit. Like it's quite a bit brighter to me than you're probably seeing. Um, Actually, I could I could I could turn off the uh, color correction. You'll see a little bit like you know it's it's a little more washed out um, than and then I correct it down. (laughs) Uh, So the magic of of movie, I wasn't actually in a, a field field in Iceland. I was just trying to play with my green screen since I knew we were going to talk about like lights and stuff. If you were to kind of give recommendation on lighting, so uh, kind of a quick tutorial. The From my research, I'm not a photography person expert, but there's kind of uh, two or three considerations. And so there's your kind of background lighting. So I've got a light here that's washing my screen or if it's a bookcase or in your case, you know, you've got some interesting things in the background. Just making that look good is like one light source, and it could be daylight if it's in, in the day. And then um, there's kind of the main light, I think that's called the key light, that's going to be kind of in front of you um, and also in the vicinity of the camera, because that's so that there's always light coming towards the camera. And then possibly another accent light off to the side. So right now you can see I'm blocking light from one of my lights. So if I didn't have anything there, it would be kind of shadowy, and it, you know, there's we. It, starts presenting dark areas and shadows and then here is in my another light and so just looking at it on the camera or the video and saying well you know does it look weird does it look you know like I'm covered by a you know half of my face and very sinister looking I mean you know that's an artistic thing some people light stuff with a very directional thing and so you know the the, the easiest most basic thing you'll see people with these ring lights kind of for YouTube streamers and it's just around the camera it is exactly what the camera sees and coming back and so it's not going to be too much shadow, but it's also 
it can be kind of washed out. You'll see a ring in people's eye reflection of that light. Um, and then it's, it's not a lot of options for interesting lighting. And so as you get more time and availability of stuff to make it interesting, you can start doing cool stuff. I mean, I always thought there's, see a lot of music videos where there's light coming from up from underneath on one side. It's kind of moody. Um, but you know, if I've got a half an hour or something to get it set up and I'm guiding someone over a zoom call to do it, then it's probably just gonna be like, Hey, get a, get a light in your house tip towards you and just at least make sure your face that's pointing towards the camera is lit up well. When you're putting on um, one of your events, how big is the team? And so I'm going to start start with that is the, the person on the artist's end is really important member of the team. So we've had a couple events where it was just the artist. And I think what you're alluding to is it was tough and it was frustrating because they're trying to plug stuff in and troubleshoot software and all this. And they're trying to get in a headspace to perform. And it was really, you know, not ideal. And so after that, we've kind of made sure that there's at least, you know, their their family member, their partner, their spouse um, there to help help with that. So take some of that load off, um, even if it's not technically demanding, it's just having to have an earpiece in and, and talk to us. So we usually use Zoom to communicate. It's kind of our back channel. Um, we also use WhatsApp, uh, especially it's pretty popular with international performers because you can do calls and stuff without having to worry about, you know, um, country codes and long distance. Um, but you have to have some way of ca talking to the person that's responsible for the, you know, production on that side. And so ideally it's a third party. And then the quarantine is making that tough. It's like, well, normally it'd be easy to have a technical person there or have someone there. But now it's like we're kind of limited to who is safe to be in the home and the sa you know same space as someone. So it's really a, a, a kind of convolution of all the all the challenges you could imagine. Um, remote and also you can't bring anyone else into the space um, and so that's one important person is that that extra person from from their family or whatever um, and then myself um, usually we try to have another person kind of technical director outside of me because handling the audio and video is two hands you know at the same time and it's it's tough um, I've, I've had to do it kind of all at once but you want another person that's kind of calling the show. They're reading down. Okay, you know, we're going to go to the interview All right now. Play the video, and so I can just kind of listen to those cues. And then if something happens, they can also go and deal with it, so that I'm not trying to like call some like, oh, the stream died and all that, because it's all happened. Every problem you can imagine, we've dealt with on the fly during a live event, and I've had to pick up my phone and call, you know, the person across town or the person in Connecticut. Um, and so that's, you know, at least three plus like whoever our person interviewing for and Matt, Matt Hensley, our director, is usually there, but other people involved. Um, and then I usually have a backup. So a, a big thing is this is this is all depending on my Internet. I had a storm and power going out yesterday. Um, and so my my kind of primary backup for Internet as I have a hotspot and I've tested it. Um, that's one thing is. Everything I've done, I've tested frequently before I ever try to do it live. So I, you know, I tell people, I was like, for every hour that's worked successfully on a stream, there's four hours at least behind that where I've investigated and researched and talked to people and tested it and then done, you know, a, a run through without the artist necessarily, just a tech run through to make sure the system works and then checking internet and then all right, let's check failover Wi-Fi hotspot internet. Um, and so that's, that's an important piece is to get into the habit of, I want to make sure this is bulletproof because Murphy's law will hit you and the stuff you couldn't have anticipated is going to happen. So you want to make sure you get your plan B and maybe your plan C. Earlier, you made a beautiful point of how it's about, uh, connecting with the community. And so I think it's, it's great for, um, some of these folks out here that are, are, tr are dipping their toe into this and, and really starting to make sure that they can try to see if they can keep their concert series that they've, they've known how to run in person in the past and moving into this new landscape. The solution might not be for people to go out right now and go, okay, I need, I need the, the 10 grand or 15 grand for the TriCaster option is to, is to work your way up this ladder um, and figure out how to do it and letting your community be the, the focus from the begin from the get go is that's the, that connection is what's important. And so these are all tools to help that. And you can ratchet your way up yeah. as for, you go. For sure. I agree. And I think it's important to remember, you know, it's, I'm getting a little older 
but we're in a generation where someone with a cell phone video on a TikTok or some other app can go viral and to get millions of views. And so, you know, a lot of artists and, and students and people we work with, you know, have really good uh, results and connection by just doing a really personal, quick, you know, low quality, hey, I'm working on this new piece, you know, check it out. I can't wait to do that. So, you know, whether it's a marketing piece of, of getting people to come to your larger concert or it's just that's really the way you're sharing your content, you know, it's I think it's important to keep our eyes open and and keep our minds open for other options you know maybe the the two-hour format of the very formal presentation isn't the only option is some of the way we connect with audience members in shorter pieces you know and should we look for these you know social media platforms or youtube or whatever um, i know we had a series in austin specifically because it was a less formal way to experience music and we got a lot of different audience members than we would have in our concert halls you know it was a cactus cafe it was a bar on the ut campus and so we'd have different you know different types of music and different fusions of um, music and stuff and the idea is oh, to constantly be looking for opportunities to connect with different groups and communities and and interests and stuff um because you have to keep invigorating what you're doing you know if you do the same thing over and over again you're always going to be getting kind of decreasing returns as your core audience ages out and whatever. And so it's like you're always going to be kind of losing um, interest unless you're doing something to maintain that. And so look look for the opportunities to think out of the box a little bit, you know. Any final tips, tricks, anything else that uh, you'd recommend as, as people are getting into this? I, I'd say just big picture, try to ask and talk to people and ask people that have had experience in this thing and, and be, you know, don't be embarrassed to reach out. I mean, I'm available if someone has some questions. I've got a couple of emails I have to answer today. Well, Eric, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your experience and your knowledge and your journey on uh, uh, helping bring classical guitar music to students and to audience members and to, uh, to the internet. <laughs> thank you, and thanks to all the GFA folks out there. Look forward to seeing some of the other uh, productions you guys are doing. Thank you so much to all of my guests, Joe Williams, Gael Salal, and Eric Pearson. Be sure to check out their websites and calendars, links are in the show notes below, for all of their upcoming virtual events. We hope this has helped inspire you to put on a virtual concert, buy a ticket for one happening somewhere in your community or around the world, donate to those virtual tip jars, or just help spread the word when you see an artist that you love performing online. We'll see you next time on GFA TV's Global Vision.